Great. So like I said, this lesson is focused on observational techniques and design in psychology. It's a non-experimental research method. In terms of our learning objectives, so we want to be able to understand the key components of observational studies, distinguish between naturalistic and controlled observations, distinguish between covert and over observations, between structured, unstructured, between participant and non-participant, and also to be able to explain the strengths and limitations of using observational methods. So thinking back to um, research methods, very basic research methods, what is the difference between an independent variable and a dependent variable? Well, we understand that the independent variable is what you manipulate to see if there's any effect on the dependent variable. And the dependent variable is what you measure. And then also in research, we have confounding variables. And I know that you all are familiar with this from last year during lockdown. I did a whole um, PowerPoint on um, control of variables such as confounding variables and extraneous variables. And remember that confounding variables are variables that the researcher may fail to control or eliminate. And they can take the nature of situational variables. So situational being outside of the participants, so it might be time of day. If you take a take part in a study in the morning, your results may differ to if you were to take part in that study in the evening. And then you've got participant variables, and these are variables that are found within the participant that would definitely affect the dependent variable. And participant variables can be things such as age, it can be gender, it can be their experience with a particular activity or task. And I put this example in the chat for you guys to do as a starter. So just to refresh your memories about what I asked you to do, to read the scenario and to identify the independent variable and the dependent variable. Is there anyone who's able to share with us what the independent variable is in this study and what the dependent variable is? You can feel free to put it in the chat or you can unmute. Um, the independent variable would it be the um, the two conditions, one being with the jazz music, one being without, so it changes. Absolutely, thank you so much, Cole. So the two conditions, one with jazz music and one without music, that would be the independent variable because it's the thing that the researcher is changing. And then what would be the dependent variable? Um, would it be the accuracy of the person's memory afterwards? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rasheen. And even taking it a step further, because you guys are top year 13 psychologists, anytime we come across variables, we must do this thing that begins with O. Can anyone remember? It's Operation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're both going to say operationalize. Yeah, absolutely. So we must operationalize our variables. So if we're testing the accuracy of one's memory, we must say, well, we're going to get a score out of 10, for example. Jazz music, we must specify what type of jazz music, how loud is the music going to be in each of these conditions? Of course, the condition without music, it must completely be silent. Well done, guys. So there may have been some noise in the background of the silent condition. We all know what type of variable this is. We literally talked about it in the previous slide. This will be a confounding variable also known as an extraneous variable. And thinking outside of the box with this particular scenario, if noise could be a potential confounding variable, what other confounding variables might there be in this study? Other than noise. The person's memory. Yeah, so the person's memory ability. Anything else? Could how you say how they're measuring memory? Because they haven't really like specified exactly like what it's based off of. Absolutely. So the method used to measure memory. How many of you study with music in the background? Anyone study with music in the background? Yeah. Yeah. So imagine like if if you're someone who already studies with music in the background and you're invited to this particular piece of research, it could be that 
because your body and your mind are already used to that type of activity, that it doesn't affect your performance in the way that the researchers may think it will. So a participant's previous experience could also act as a, a confounding variable. I'm hoping you guys can see that. Well done for engaging, guys. I really appreciate it. So we continue. What are observations? Observational studies simply involve watching and recording people's behaviour, usually carried out by observing people's natural behaviour in their natural environment. However, we know from previous research that it doesn't always have to be a natural environment. Sometimes it can occur in a controlled lab-like environment. And why do psychologists use observations? Well, they use it to study a particular behaviour, they use it to study natural behaviour in a natural setting. They can also use it to study behaviours where it would be unethical to manipulate or which can't be directly manipulated by the researcher. And here I'm, I'm my memory is um, recalling the case study of Jeannie in attachment. Remember that case study where this young lady, unfortunately, she was neglected by her parents and she was raised by animals, so she was a feral child. And researchers took it upon themselves that they could actually observe her development since she was rescued from being raised from those um, animals. We could argue that would be a natural observation. It's not that the researchers caused her to be abused and neglected by her parents just for the purposes of research. It's something that naturally occurred and they've sought out the opportunity to observe what was going on. So observational studies are able to reveal different aspects of behaviour than other methods. And the reason they are able to do this is because what people say that they will do is very different to what people actually do. A good example of that would be if you remember from social influence, thinking about the topic of obedience, um, Hofflin's nurses study. The nurses in this particular experiment, they were called on the phone introduced to a doctor who asked them to administer a drug to patients, a lethal dose of an, an unknown drug to patients. And despite the fact that nurses, when they were asked, oh, would you do this? All of them said, no, we wouldn't do it. But when it came to the actual crunch, 21 out of 22 of them went ahead and they were ready to administer the drug. And that observational study allowed us to say, well, actually what people say they're gonna do when it comes to obedience is very different to what they do in those actual situations. And you wouldn't be able to get that information if not for the use of observational studies. However, observations alone do not provide information about what people do in the sense of, it doesn't tell you why they've done it. It doesn't give you any, um, any basis to make an assumption about why they've done or why they performed a particular behavior. Good example would be if the nurses went on to administer the drug and you just paused there, you said, well, we're not gonna investigate it any further. You could dig deeper and get into the, the crux of it. Why did you administer that drug? What were some of the factors that caused you to feel like you had to administer that lethal dose? Why didn't you? So the one nurse who didn't administer the drug, you could ask questions, but that means that outside of observational studies, you're now drawing upon other research method techniques such as self-report. And we all know that there are some downfalls of using a self-report method. So now we're getting into the different types of observations. Um, I'm gonna to touch on each type and we'll have a look at some of the strengths and the weaknesses of each type as we go along. So to start off with, we've got controlled versus naturalistic observations and it's literally in the name. A controlled observation takes place in a controlled environment, in a lab-like environment and in a situation like this participants are likely to be aware that they are being studied. Also if you are invited into this very controlled artificial environment to be observed, naturally your behaviour would change and we would see evidence of demand characteristics. Can anyone remember what demand characteristics are when it comes to psychological research? Is it like, is it like the, the participants, participants sort of figure out what is being researched or try to? Absolutely. Thank you, Izzy. So it's where participants literally, as you said, they change their behaviour 
in response to the perceived aims of the experiment or of the study. And as a result, it means that it lowers the internal validity of the study, because remember what validity is, is this idea that you are measuring, and you are studying what you've intended to measure or study. You won't be doing that if participants have changed their behaviour in response to what they think you should um, think how they should behave, if that makes sense. And then we've got low ecological validity, because if the observation is taking place in this lab like environment, then oftentimes it doesn't reflect the real world and therefore you can't generalize your findings to everyday life. And then you've got naturalistic observations and you have the words natural in there, really to emphasize the point that these naturalistic observations takes place in the participants realistic environment. And for this one, I can remember Shaffa and Emerson's study in attachment where they got mothers to um, keep diaries of their baby's response to separation anxiety and so on. And this, of course, took place in their own home. So we might say that that study is an example of a natural observation. In this type of observation, behaviour is not controlled. People behave freely and they are less likely to know that they are being observed. And the researcher doesn't interfere. They simply observe what is going on. And here, this is just echoing what we've discussed about controlled versus naturalistic. Let's see, let me go back. So we've got participant versus non-participant observations. And this type of observation, um, again, it's in the name. So participant observation is where the researcher behaves as though they are a participant and they immerse themselves with the, the rest of the participants in the study. One example of this will be Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Study. Can anyone remember the role that Zimbardo played in that particular study? You can put it in the chat or you can unmute. What was Zimbardo's role in that study, apart from being a key researcher? How did he behave? Wasn't he like the prison guard on the head? Exactly. The, yeah. He was. Yeah. So he was the guard. I think in America they call them the superintendent or something like that. I don't know how to spell it. You guys know what it means. Superintendent. And in that sense, we would say that Zimbardo, of course, he may have experienced some sort of um, researcher bias where he was so immersed in the in the research, he couldn't have an outside view because he was literally playing the role of a participant as well. Then we've got non-participant observation. This is where researchers do not become actively involved in the behaviour being studied. The observer is separate from the people being observed and simply watches or listens. Um, examples of this may include Milgram and Ainsworth's research. Another type of observation would be overt versus covert. And if you think O for open and C for closed, that should give you an idea as to um, what these types of observations are driving at. So over observations is where the participants are aware that they are being studied. In other words, you've actually received informed consent from them. Whereas covert observations, participants are not aware that they are being observed. Thinking about some of the benefits and disadvantages of overt and covert observations, some of them are very, very obvious to us. Within covert observations, participants will behave naturally because they're not aware that they are being studied. However, we might say it's actually quite intrusive to study someone without obtaining their full consent. Whereas in an overt observation, participants have the opportunity to give their informed consent because they are aware that they are being observed. However, you're going to see more issues with demand characteristics and social desirability bias. And then still on ethical issues, we might also stress that there might be an invasion of privacy, lack of in informed consent, like we said earlier. And thinking about the practical element, 
with observations. Observations are very time consuming. Very, very time consuming. I remember when I was doing my masters and I, I think I've mentioned to you guys, my observational method was to record over 3000 tweets from students. On the topic of assessment and not only to record and read them, but then to categorize them. And it took a very, very long time to do. This is why researchers tend to avoid observational designs and techniques, and they may opt for self report designs such as questionnaires and interviews. There's also the risk of observer bias, and this is where if you as an observer have your own um, perceived hypothesis about how you expect your participants to behave, then you might be looking out for those behaviours and you might ignore some key behaviours that have occurred within your observational research, but you've just overlooked it because you, you haven't considered that view and your focus on your hypothesis. But observer bias can be overcome by inviting another person or even more than two people to take part as observers in your research. And what you can do through that is you can establish inter-observer reliability. And I'll give you an example. It might be that myself, Beth, Nicole and Izzy, we say we are going to conduct research and we just want to observe how year nines are coping during, um, during this live lesson lockdown scenario. And we come together, we watch a few year nine lessons and Eventually, we say, well, I saw this one group and maybe um, Beth says, yeah, this group were really, really good, well behaved. And then Izzy says, actually, no, I don't think they were very well behaved. We might say that there's a lack of inter-observer reliability because there's two different polarised views on the assessment of how year nines are behaved. The way to improve inter-observer reliability would be to have like a behavioural category, a coding sheet where you're looking at for specific behaviours. And that way, everyone understands the meaning of each behavior on that coding category. And as you tick it, you come together, you will see that, oh, there's a lot of agreement between us. Our inter-observer reliability is much higher as a result. I'm hoping that example made sense to you guys. Are there any questions at this point before we continue? Wonderful. I'm taking the silence as no questions. So here is a table. It's just taken a while to come up on the screen. Oh, it's but it's there now. Let me just go back again. This thing is so annoying. There we go. <laughs> so here is the table comparing the different types of observations that we have had a look at um, so far. And you can refer to this table, you can use this table as a revision tool because it offers a nice comparison of the different types. Now for this part of the lesson, we are going to explore the two remaining types of observation, but we're going to do it in this way. So you will see. The task is I'm going to assign you to three, um, one of three groups. Group one, you're going to watch this video and it's a, a excerpt of a Big Brother episode. You're going to watch it. And you are going to simply record everything you see in that video as much as possible. Group two, you are going to create a coding sheet and it's up to you what behaviours you're going to put on that coding sheet. And you can do this on your own like scrap paper at home. It doesn't need to be too fanciful. You might put something like violent behaviour, swearing, think about Big Brother. Um, think about the type of things that you would typically see in an episode of Big Brother. For those of you who, I don't know whether you guys actually watch Big, Big Brother, think about Love Island, the typical behaviours you would see in Love Island and come up with behavioural categories for that. Group three, you are going to record what you see every 30 seconds. And by doing this task, you're not only taking the position of psychologists as researchers, but you're also going to see the pitfalls and some of the strengths of the particular observation technique that you are going to use. So for those of you who were in group one, how did you find trying to record everything that took place? 
Um, it was like easy and difficult at the same time, I think, because it was easy in the sense like you didn't have to think about it too much. You could just kind of like write everything down that you thought of like as kind of important. But at the same time, it was hard to know what was important. Like I didn't know whether to focus on like what they were saying or what I was seeing or like their emotion and stuff like that. So it was like, OK, because I could just I didn't have to think too much about what I was writing down. But at the same time, I kind of did. That yeah. Makes yeah i'm totally with you on that thank you so much for sharing those of you in group two you had the coding category one how did you find that um well we didn't know that you were meant to like discuss what the category should have been beforehand so i think we all kind of did our own categories but then we discussed at the end and we had similar ones um mm -hmm. i think it definitely helped having the categories because you could like i did a tally for how many times like different things happened um but then it was kind of hard because you didn't really know what was going to happen so there could be like events that you didn't record or stuff that you recorded that wasn't that important mm. and maybe when it comes to having like behavior categories it could be that some categories that you've got down don't quite capture some of the behaviors that are presented that you're observing yeah exactly Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And finally, group three, you had to record what you saw every 30 seconds. How did you find that? Um, it was all right because you could actually focus a lot more on what they were doing in yeah. between. The, but, but then, I don't know, I think I'd rather just do everything because at some points it got quite repetitive. Because mm. I could just be I more like, because so it was like quite similar what they were saying all the time. Yeah. Yeah, and you could miss out things in the 30 seconds that, like, obviously you're doing it every 30 seconds, and at that moment in time, you might have missed something that was more important before the point when you were actually going to observe at the 30 seconds. Absolutely. Both of you are absolutely right. I mean, there's value in not having so much to record, so having that time frame where it's every 30 seconds, but then it means that that 30 second period. So from one to 29 seconds, you're not recording what's occurring and there could be valuable things that are happening during that period. So you're absolutely right. Well done, guys. I mean, what you've done is you've engaged in a structured and an unstructured observation. And thank you so much for sharing with each other. And I hope that you found the task, um, I guess, valuable and enjoyable somewhat. So let's continue with the PowerPoint. Group one. You guys, you used an example of an unstructured observation, and this is another type of observation that is used in psychological research. Um, of course, we understand that the negative of this is that sometimes the amount of information that you have to capture is overwhelming, you know, and it's also highly subjective. So someone did share that you didn't know what was important behaviour to record, you didn't know was a less important behavior to record and therefore you're relying on your own subjectivity to determine what exactly you take down. The positive is that this type of observation can provide rich information and in essence you can use it as a pilot study to see what kind of behaviors can be recorded in a structured system. So it could be that the information that group one obtained they could have passed it on to group two and said well this is what we observed can you create behavioral categories based on this and then they have created the behavioural categories and they move on to have an in-depth analysis. The final point here is that unstructured observations produce qualitative data. And remember that qualitative data is non-numerical data. The next one is a structured observation. And this is where the researcher uses various systems to organise the recording of observations. Two main systems are the use of behavioural categories, which you guys used earlier, and also sampling. And these type of structured observations provide quantitative data. So observational design, structured observations, when you're using behavioural categories, it's important that you operationalise these categories. And this is you literally breaking down what behaviours you are specifically looking out for. So if you say, or my behavioural category is violence. Well, violence is too broad because violence can be captured in very low level disruptive behaviour. So it might be pinching. Violence can be an extreme behaviour. Violence can be seen in even the language that is used. So you need to be specific about what behaviours you're looking out for. 
you have to be objective so you can't make assumptions about a person's behavior so if you see somebody slap another person in your observation you can't say oh they slapped them because of xyz as a researcher you must be totally objective and if you want to find out why the person slapped another person or why they exhibited a particular behavior then you must ask the participant and they must self-report on their behaviors Behavioural categories have to cover all possible components and they have to be what we call mutually exclusive. Now, all this means is that behavioural categories ideally should not overlap. And on the next slide, I'll show you an example of behavioural categories that oftentimes do overlap. And you will see how actually being mutually exclusive is virtually impossible when it comes to behavioural categories for observations. And then finally, under a structured observation, you've got the sampling procedure. And this type of sampling is not to do with your participant sample, but it's to do with how often you record the observed behaviour. There's event sampling, where you record every time an event happens, so every time a particular behaviour happens. And then there's time sampling, where you record behaviours using a specific time interval. So I remember in Mary Ainsworth's strange situation, she used a 15 second interval where she was recording what behaviours were shown by the caregiver and the mother, um, the infant and the caregiver during 15 second intervals. In the example that you guys have just engaged in, you've done it every 30 seconds for group three. So here's an example of a coding scheme, which is also known as a behavioural checklist. The observer simply ticks the relevant category when one of the behaviours occurs. And you may notice the problem that, that arises when a behaviour occurs which fits more than one category, such as, let's say you are um, observing students when the teacher leaves the room, or you're observing students in silent study. It could be that within silent study or in the classroom, you've got students who are able to carry on working, while using their mobile phone, also while talking to another student, also while listening to music. You can see where I'm going with this, that actually oftentimes behavioural categories can overlap in any single like one observation, and therefore it might present issues later on down the line when the researcher is trying to organise their data into a numerical form. It's not too much of an issue if the researcher is in interested in keeping their data as qualitative. And I think that is it. Cool. I hope you guys have a good afternoon. Thank you. You are welcome. Thanks, Miss. Thanks, Miss. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, Miss. Hello.